Coming up on today's show, Able Gamers had quite the weekend. There's more Resident Evil news, and Mario Rivera is here. What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Monday morning live at twitch.tv slash what's good games at 11 a.m. Pacific time. I'm Andrea Renee, joined by Miss Brittany Brombacher. Hello. Hi, Britt. Good to see Hi. you. And special Hi. guest Mario Rivera is here. Hey, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Thank you so much. This is a fantastic opportunity. Thank you so much. Well, we are glad that you are here because somebody has to nerd out with Britt about this upcoming news that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Yes! <laughs> Wait, we could just yeah. do a whole episode of Brit Faces. Just all Brit Faces, the whole episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you want to fund my Botox after that, Andrea. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> be careful the more we talk about botox the more one star reviews we get apparently oh yeah we oh, got a no. one star review because i talked about how i got botox oh, when was this like i don't know a long time months ago. and months ago <laughs> months yeah. ago yeah it's a month like that's that's not good body image for young women to talk about botox I'm like and oh i'm sorry like, i didn't realize taking control of my body and doing what i want to do with it was not good for women sorry Listen, Sorry. your face, your choice. You do what you want That's with it. it. That's, That's it, our you know, motto. Yeah. Anyway. Um, well, Mario, we're so glad that you're here. For folks that are watching either live on Twitch or that are listening on podcast services or at youtube.com slash what's good games, can you tell us a little bit about what you do as the video manager of Dual Shockers? Uh, yes, yeah. So at Dual Shockers, I am the primary person that will be managing the different aspects of the different team of like editorials, reviews, and converting them into video products for our YouTube channel, um, as well as some original content when it comes to discussion. Very podcasty-like. We haven't really got an official podcast. I'm trying to convince them to do that. That'd be really great. But ultimately, yes, it's to uh, facilitate people to bring their their articles to life. Um, that's what been primarily what we've been doing this uh, last year that I've been doing this for the channel and really trying to just give it an identity. So that's pretty much the main goal is just to bring uh, Dual Shockers to light with the YouTube channel. So I've been trying to do that as much as I possibly can. Nice. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. And is a lot of work. As somebody who used to be a video yes. manager like way, way back in the day, <laughs> um, it's, it's something that I think a lot of outlets need and is necessary, but is usually like the unsung hero role of making any video channel run. So thumbs up to you, Mario. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. We do have just a couple of quick announcements. Our Patreon exclusive streams are going to be happening this Saturday. Times will be yet to be determined. So keep your eye on patreon.com slash what's good games if you want to get on our happy hour Q&A or our after hour stream. Or of course, you can always follow us on Twitter at what's good underscore games. And next week on Monday's live show, Jeff Kanata will be joining us. So if you guys missed it over the weekend, yesterday, in fact, I guested on DLC Jeff Kanata and Kristen Spicer's podcast. And it was a super fun time. We talked about all the games that we've been playing for the console launch. So please do go check out that episode. And then Jeff is going to come guest on our show because Britt, I realize that you, Steimer, and me have all guested on DLC, but we haven't had Jeff on the show yet. I know. That's kind of messed up. But we'll, we'll fix it, and it will be good. That's awesome. Well, yeah, he does have two small really children nice. that we have to work around, so. I mean, I have a dog. That's true, but I would imagine that Reb's schedule isn't as strict as, say, you know, a two-year-old's. No, you're right. I, yeah, you know, that, that was just to move on, Andrea. That was <laughs> <laughs> not Let's to take anything on. away from fur babies fur babies are important. no it's okay listen he was potty trained in like six days and i know kids are crapping their pants until they're like 18 it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> i mean listen if you're allowing your child to crap their pants until they're 18 you have some parenting issues that you maybe need to work out that's all i'm saying yeah <clears throat> seems like social awkwardness and that kid's gonna have a rough go of it in life just food for thought. Maybe don't poop your pants until you're yeah, Or star an Adam Sandler movie. It's one or the other. <laughs> or that. Or yeah. that. Let's get to the news, shall we? Because <laughs> we have some really fun news to talk about and to get uh. our show started with. So you guys know that we had been raising money to help our friend Steven Spawn of Able Gamers to get to his $1 million birthday goal that he kicked off with his friend Ryan Reynolds, which feels like ages ago, but really was only about like a 
two months ago. And then over the weekend, GlitchCon happened because no actual IRL TwitchCon could happen this year. They did GlitchCon, which they featured a bunch of cool creators, including friend of the show, Zombie Kills, who finally got her partner status. Congratulations Yay! to Zombie. And Steven Spawn was also featured on stream where they gifted him, well, not him, but Able Gamers, one million dollars. Brittany, would you mind reading these details? Absolutely. So fucking cool. So this comes from IGN. Twitch to donate one million to Able Gamers to help gamers with disabilities. So Twitch has committed to donate one million to the Able Gamers charity to help, quote, change the lives of thousands of people with disabilities. Steven Spahn, the COO of Able Gamers, had a goal for his 40th birthday to raise one million for the Able Gamers charity, a group that utilizes funds to bring inclusion and improved quality of life for people with disabilities through the power of video games. As of a few hours before the announcement, Spawn's initiative had earned over $150,000 in donations, and Dr. Lupo helped reveal that Twitch would be donating an extra $1 million to Able Gamers to help make a difference for so many around the world. This is so fucking cool. So and then good. Yes yesterday, if you missed it, there was the 2020 Video Game Accessibility Awards. So Twitch wanted that me to let you that yeah so it happened yes. yeah okay. in class i can't yeah. keep track of my days all right <laughs> so this comes from GameSpot. so we're gonna talk a little bit about that now so the presentation was hosted by alana pierce friend of the show love her so much and able gamer steven spawn with a panel of presenters including several twitch streamers fellow accessibility advocates and voice actor troy baker the awards included categories like same controls but different and clear text the presenters each gave a brief explanation of the category, and then following each announcement, Spawn walked viewers through how each category solves for a specific accessibility problem. For example, the second channel category, which was won by The Last of Us Part Two, honored games that offered an alternative or additional way of accessing game information for player for game yeah for players who can't access it through in-game tools. The Last of Us Part Two was the only game to receive more than one award, but lots of Lots of this year's biggest games were represented in, represented in at least one of the categories. You can watch the full stream and check out the list of winners at GameSpot.com and watch the whole stream on Alana's YouTube channel. Oh, guy, Charlana, Charlana, I can never say it. Charlanazard? Charlanazard. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Charizard, Charizard, Charizard with Alana I, right in the middle. I know. I keep just yeah. saying Charizard, and then I just get Charlanazard. <laughs> it's all fucked up. <laughs> And thank anyway. you, um, PSW, for putting the link to the full show in the Twitch chat for people who are joining us live. Um, I can't believe Alana didn't mention this when she was on the show I last week. Yeah. <gasps> I know that she's got a lot going on. Yes. And actually, she said that today was going to be the day that she announced her new gig. Has she made that announcement yet? She is not. No, Ooh. she said something about six hours ago. That yeah, it was today. So we'll see. Yes. Yeah, so she told us um, on Wednesday that the announcement of her announcement is that she was going to announce at some point today. I don't know if she's still sticking with that plan. She obviously has been incredibly busy, and the amount of charitable work that she has been doing has been just wonderful. And she's great. If you guys didn't check out Friday's show with her. Myself and Steimer, please do. It was fun. Unfortunately, it was a little on the short side, but that's because we only had a very brief time with her because <laughs> she's busy. And mm -hmm. I feel like she's making a run for my title, busiest lady in the business. <laughs> and I feel like I have to give it to her. I feel like I just need to like pass the torch because she's <laughs> definitely busier than I am, um, which is by design. I'm intentionally trying not to be so busy anymore these days. But um, shout out to Steve and Spawn and to Able Gamers. We love those guys over there. They're doing great work. And to Alana for working with them to set the accessibility awards up. So um, just some fun news to kick off our Monday. And Yay. some even more fun news to kick off our Monday. Xbox Series X and S was the biggest Xbox launch ever. So this write-up comes from Eurogamer. Microsoft has trumpeted that their new launch is the biggest in history, though they're not providing specific sales figures, which of course they haven't been doing. Phil Spencer broke the news on Twitter saying, thank you for supporting the largest launch in Xbox history. In 24 hours, more new consoles sold in more countries than ever before. We're working with retail to resupply as quickly as possible, and you continue to show us the connective power of play is more important than ever. The mention of more countries this time around is also important to note. Xbox Series S and X arrived on the same day in 37 markets compared to just 13 for Xbox One. Don't expect sales numbers anytime in the future, though. 
even if Xbox overtakes PlayStation this generation, which, I mean, I kind of find that hard to believe, but we'll see. Uh, Spencer says, I can promise you I won't do that. In the last year, we've had Google and Amazon and now Facebook announcing they're coming into our gaming space. I'm not going to go compete with their numbers based on how many Xbox Series X I've sold. Google is never going to talk about how many Chromecast Pros they sold. They're going to talk about how many players they have. Oh. Quote, I think people who want to pit us against Sony based on who sold the most consoles lose the context of what gaming is about today. There are 3 billion people who play games on the planet, but maybe only 200 million households that have a video game console. In a way, the console space is becoming a smaller and smaller percentage of the overall gaming pie. What do you think about that, Mario? Well, uh, as much as I'm happy that this is their biggest launch and hopefully as many people can get an Xbox Series X as they possibly can, that, that's exciting. Um, in the same way that I think that um, Spencer even said, like they're not going to be saying numbers because I believe that I don't think it also necessarily really matters if you have the system or not, because I think the ecosystem is primarily based on xCloud and Game Pass um, to be able to play wherever you want and anywhere. So the fact that this system has now launched on, you know, on, its, on its launch week into 37s, it's pretty big. I mean, I remember watching the original launch for 360 on G4. So it's cool that, mm -hmm. you know, this is something, <laughs> you know, um, some good news for this year. But ultimately, yeah, I, I still think that they're not playing the same game that they were playing years before, where it's all based on consoles, because they know they've, they've learned their lesson last last year, uh, last uh, generation, I should say. Um, but yeah, in terms of how many people are playing, I think that's their end goal at the end of the day. Very exciting. It is a cool time to be a gamer. I feel like every fucking PR <laughs> speak says that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So I think the biggest launch I read this was from their Xbox One launch, and that was over a million sold in 24 hours. Uh, so it's not incredibly exciting, not to be a Debbie Downer here, but it's not incredibly like, oh my God, that they would overtake that scene as that that only launched in like, what, 13 countries and this launched in 37. So of course you expect that they would sell more. But like, regardless, it's so cool, especially seeing that we're in the middle of a pandemic yes. that, you know, obviously the demand for consoles is just like going up, up, up. And I think Nintendo can attest for that. We don't have it in the news, but they have been the top selling console for 23 months now. I think I, I think it's. Yeah, that's, that's what I read too. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, cool. Let's go. Go on to your bad self, Xbox. Yeah, it was yeah. interesting. Last night on DLC, Christian was making a good point about how many gamers this generation haven't yet paid to upgrade to Xbox Series X or S because they have Game Pass Ultimate and they're PC players. And there really isn't a reason if you have a gaming PC to get into the console market just yet because there isn't an exclusive that really is a driver to buy that game because Game Pass works on so many different devices, especially with xCloud integration happening as well. And I thought that that was a really valid point because clearly Microsoft is going to make more money in the long term by selling Game Pass and Game Pass Ultimate subscriptions and getting those people on the hook paying that monthly fee than they are going to be selling a $300 or a $500 box one time, right? We all know that mm -hmm. software is what drives profitability for all of the console makers in the long term. But that, you know, selling hardware also can be profitable. But Xbox has had this position for a long time now, so it's not surprising. But I, I am a little, like, skeptical that if they are able to overtake Sony or Nintendo, that the stockholders of Microsoft wouldn't want to hear that the company is doing so well publicly to, if nothing else, drive shareholder value. But time no, will tell, I, I guess. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. The moment that you find out that they're they're somewhat in the lead, they're going to talk about it because PlayStation talked about it. I mean, as much as that there's not a competition between the two, there really are, uh, especially when it comes to uh, like Google Stadia and stuff like that. Like, I mean, yeah, they, they are going to say that like they're not going to tell somebody Chromecast, but at the same time, it's like when you hear that number and it is a large number, you're going to say something. But at the end of the day, they're still focusing on that subscriber base. And I think that's going to be the more impressive number at the at the end all. Like I'm I'm able to play uh, Tell Me Why on my phone via xCloud, you know, and I don't actually need the system necessarily. Or I can play a majority of the games like on, on my PC if I want with Ultimate Game Pass. So like I said, I think that is definitely going to be the focus of this generation going forward. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm very curious uh, what the numbers end up being. I'm always a sucker for when they have like... PlayStation sold 70 million Xbox. We don't know, you know, so we'll see. Mario, do you think the Series S will ultimately outsell the Series X? 
That is a solid question. And that's actually something interesting because I actually come from a GameStop background mm-hmm. and people rely on the discs, um, especially in the pre in the in the pre-owned market when people are families and needed discounts and stuff like that. So while I think the S is such a great value in terms of how much it costs, at the end of the day, can families uh, subsidize that when it comes to like buying games because i mean not a lot of not a lot of people ask for the digital sales from when i remember playing uh, working at games uh yeah gamestop mm-hmm. so that's that's to me where it stems from is like i think the pre-owned i, I think I, uh, i'm trying to think i'm honestly it's, 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 say, right? it's really hard to say but I, I that's why i want to come from the gamestop perspective of people playing games with discs and the resale value but again when it comes to new it's it's i don't know it's hard to say I think as Xbox pushes Game Pass, I think that's when you're yes. going to really start seeing the Series S skyrocket. I think right now you have all the enthusiasts getting the Series X, right? They want the big yeah. the big refrigerator box, all the big <laughs> floppy flip flip, terra floppity flops. Uh, but yeah, I think as they push Game Pass, you're going to see everyone be like, okay, yeah. well, if I can hey, save it. GameStop's happy I'm not working there anymore because they're like, you want to buy a game? It's on Game Pass. Like, why would you buy? <laughs> well, I, I think like it's a, uh, it's, the conversation about digital ownership is absolutely something that needs to be, you know, reminded that we need to not let that go by the wayside. But yeah. I think it's also about looking at overall costs. You know, a lot of families can't afford yet one more subscription added to their list, right? And so I sure. think what they need to balance is, you know, what kind of value are we getting and are these games that we're going to use? Because I think we all have been guilty of maintaining a subscription to something that was valuable to us at one point, but now we're paying for it and not using it. Right. (laughs) All Um, the time. So it's just like, is it going to maintain its value over time? If you don't want to go back and continually play old games and Microsoft isn't releasing new games on game pass as often as they potentially should be or could be, you know what I mean? So I think that it's all about looking at what your budget is and what kind of value you're going to get out of it. And if digital ownership is something that you're okay with, instead of having a disc that you're going to to own. But it's like with the online connectivity that so many disc games even require these days, it's I feel, I fear it's going to be a moot conversation in the not too distant future anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fair point. But let's move on to what I believe is going to be Britt's favorite story of the week. Uh, do you want to talk about this? Or do you want me to read this? You can read it and I can grunt along. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so this story leaked over the weekend. Resident Evil, Resident Evil Village launch date has been leaked in a massive Capcom ransomware attack, which is not good, obviously. Not good. That's not what um, I'm grunting about. No, not grunting no. about that. No grunting no. about ransomware attacks. Those no. are bad. Uh, Capcom's plans for new games, including Resident Evil Village's launch, plus source code for some games, which is bad, and other corporate financial secrets were leaked overnight Sunday by a ransomware attack that began on November 2nd. The company confirmed the attack, but not the leaked details, of course. In a news release on Monday morning today, morning that the personal information of as many as 350,000 persons had been compromised. This potentially includes information for both customers, shareholders, and employees. A a copy of the ransom note Capcom received was posted to Reset Era, a group called Ragnar Locker claimed responsibility. The BBC reported, I should mention that this story is being written by Polygon, indicated that Capcom had refused to pay the ransom. Obviously, you don't, you know. (laughs) You don't negotiate. Uh, Users on Reset Era also noted that some of the information appears to come from 2018. So Capcom's plans for the games mentioned may have changed since then. Um, Considering that the pandemic happened this year, I'm pretty sure all of their plans have changed. (laughs) According to the ransom leaks, Resident Evil Village was planned for April 2021. Monster Hunter Stories 2 was also slated for 2021 in June on Nintendo Switch and will launch on PC as well. There's also a Battle Royale-type multiplayer Resident Evil on the way, according to leaked information. An Ace Attorney collection for PlayStation 4 and Nintendo Switch is said to be in the works. And Monster Hunter Rise will follow its March 2021 launch on Switch with an October 2021 launch on PC. Now, most intriguing, the hackers exposed payments made to Capcom for putting its games on certain platforms, which is... 
Something that we very rarely ever see is those kind of inner business deals happening. Internal documents said Google Stadia paid Capcom $10 million for Resident Evil 7 and Resident Evil 8, and Sony paid $5 million to Capcom to make Resident Evil 7 for PlayStation VR, plus a timed exclusive on the game's DLC. So while ah. the way we got the leak is bad, and they should yeah. feel bad, and... It's not good when people's personal information is leaked by ransomware, by hackers. I still think this information is interesting. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Like you said, especially those uh, little that, those deals. Those little, little deals. Listen, Andrew, here's what we need to do. I love What's Good Games. It's fantastic. But I say we quit the podcast, we make a video game, and then have these fuckers pay us millions of dollars to put it on their platform. Um, hmm... You know, I feel like this is a good idea in theory, but <laughs> I've never made a video game before. Have you? No, but I'm really good at Microsoft Paint. <laughs> That's so I it. Feel That's Absolutely. it. We're just going to do a Microsoft Paint simulator. It'll be perfect. <laughs> No, this is really interesting. So an April release date for Resident Evil Village, I feel like that's out of the question now. I feel like if they were so close to an April 2021 launch date, we would have heard about it by now. That's not that far away. And so I I can't see that happening. Well, I think that's uh, unless we hear something at Game Awards. Like if, if that was going to be the time that they might have said something. You think so? Oh, that's, that's a fair point. I mean, Game Awards yeah. is less than a it's month away now. Mere yeah. weeks. But I'm trying to remember when um, Resident Evil, it was either two, January. It was actually seven, actually, if I'm not mistaken. It came out in January, but it was it was revealed only like a couple months. It was actually, it was at E3, if I'm not mistaken. But the Resident date. Evil the, seven, yeah. The, but did we get the date that day as well? I don't remember, but I, I do don't think remember so. Resident okay. Evil 3 remake. Remember when that was announced? Yes. When a Sony State of Play. And then they did announce the release date, which wasn't that far off. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, Game of Words is possible, but I don't know. Just something in my gut tells me that it's it's not going to happen. I hope it happens. I really, truly do, because that's not far off. No. But yeah, I don't know. Mm, I just don't think that's happening. Oh, well. Um, This other interesting news, Mar so Mario's a Resident Evil yeah. fan. Yeah, so this is, I feel like I'm among my people right now, which is <laughs> there. What about this Battle Royale multiplayer Resident Evil game? That's I can't. Nice. I can't even fathom because it's funny. Uh, the other multiplayer game that I've played recently was, of course, the Resident Evil 3 um, uh, mode that had, you know, sort of like a asymmetrical style gameplay. And yeah. as well, while as much as like I'm glad that was a part of the, the package that they had there, I didn't really play it that much. So that's what makes me scared about the Battle Royale thing. And honestly, I can't even fathom it. Like, is it 100 survivors in the, in the city, like, which would be kind of cool? Or is it like, what exactly, like, do you die and you become a zombie and you have to fight everybody? Like, what exactly right. could you go with this? Yeah. Do you, are you dropping in? Are you like, what is what is going on? Yeah, unless it's kind of the idea of you can play as a survivor as a human, or perhaps mm -hmm. you can play as one of the bioweapons, right? But yeah. in which case, I feel like you'd have a disaster of balancing that. Because if you think about like the nemesis or the tyrant, you know, versus like a little plebe zombie, like how do you even make those go hand to hand? Or unless you just take like the iconic scenes from the franchise, like Raccoon City or maybe the underground labs or whatnot, yeah. and you just put survivors in there. Like, I don't know. It seems like an interesting concept, but I'm not sure how they yeah. would pull it off. Who I'm trying to break that? away from the idea from 100 people. It probably won't be 100 people <laughs> running around. Imagine? Oh my god! Lab. Yeah, mm. but I can see like thirty to forty, maybe in a small area. Like if it's a town setting or if it's a village setting, you know, whatever it ends up being. A um, village setting, you say? Yeah, oh, yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, the other thing that I didn't see mentioned in here, unless I just totally missed it, was the rumor of a of Resident Evil Four going to Oculus. Oh, uh, that was on some of the other articles That's that I had read. That was one of the other things. Yeah, which is, I feel like if Resident Evil 4 goes anywhere, you think it would be PlayStation VR. You wouldn't think Oculus. Yeah, knowing yeah. their relationship with PlayStation and how they've announced, you know, a couple of the last Resident Evil titles on PlayStation platforms, that would make sense. But Oculus has been paying quite a bit of money for titles for Quest and for just the main Oculus platform as well. So um, wouldn't be surprising if, Capcom wanted to, you know, <laughs> make that money because <laughs> why not? But I, I agree with you, Brittany. It would make more sense for PSVR. 
to be a badass because you know PSVR 2.0 launch title. It would be oh, good. Oh, but in, that would be the, the thing the that we don't think Red exists, but maybe exists. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Who could, yeah. Say? who could say? But interesting thought though, if they do put Resident Evil 4 in VR, because Resident Evil 4 is like a really close over the shoulder, right? They would have to completely overhaul the entire not overhaul the entire game. That's an exaggeration, but sure. the perspective would greatly have to change, right? Have you played Resident Evil 4, Mario? Uh, this year. Uh, oh, okay. okay, so you're fresh. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very fresh on it. So actually, yeah, I'm very positive on that game. I I, I went through my I was I was saying before the show, I was like I went through my Resident Evil Odyssey of all the ones that I missed out because I decided to just stop uh, after a certain point. Uh, finished four, finished five, skip six because I played it with a friend years ago. And honestly, yeah. do we need to talk about six? Uh, let's let's no. not talk about six. Seven, which was also uh, really great. Well, I just finished on stream playing it for Halloween, so that was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, I mean. It'd be interesting to see if uh, the gameplay in terms of like just playing like the standard mode of like over the shoulder, similar to RE3 and RE2 uh, remake. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mm -hmm. mind that to be like the main. And then the optional experience is to go first person. If they're able to, you know, to combine those aspects. I'm not sure if it's possible. I'm not a game developer. But hey, if, if they're going to put some support to it, I, I don't see why not. Especially I'm very curious, like how different the remake might be in comparison to the original. Because the original uh -huh. is very fun but also very, very silly. <laughs> so out of there. And I think when we get Village, I think it's going to be just as silly. I think Village's silliness <laughs> might put Resident Evil 4 silliness to, to shame, but we'll see. Yeah, I just want a cart ride. This is bring the cart back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Ah. Ooh, that was therapeutic. Thanks, Andrea. You're a trooper. <laughs> you know what? I'm here to help you enjoy your best Resident Evil life, Britt. Whatever I can That's do, a good friend. That's you a just friend. let me know. And speaking of Brit living her best life, oh, I guess man. technically this is not you living your best life because you don't <laughs> no. live in Japan. Why does oh. Japan get all the cool shit is literally in bold and in caps in the show notes. Who would have um, everything is in Japan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so Japan, speaking of Japan, gets a Final Fantasy VII remake action stealth escape room style game wow that's Is a mouthful it, did i yeah. did i read that correctly <laughs> yeah i think you did i'm happy to read this if you want to get the video going yeah please do cute. okay it's so this real. comes from destructoid so japan is getting a real life final fantasy 7 remake experience at the tokyo mystery circus in shinjuku it's a quest to blow up the mako reactor as as up to three people sneak around the Shinra compound, casting mysterious spells and dodging soldiers. Like, this sounds like everything I've ever wanted in my life. There's a 30-minute time limit, but getting shot by Shinra will subtract from the time. It's an escape room type thing, but with more emphasis on stealth and action than on puzzles. There may be some mind benders, as the description on the game site says players need to, quote, break through gimmicks and traps while hiding themselves from the enemy. It's officially called a real infiltration game, and so this debuts in December in japan and right now they're showing just some yeah look at this look at this friend so if you're just listening on you know <laughs> audio it's, it's showing all these like it's showing these fun people like going around pretending and larping around in this room they're crawling around on shit they're hiding behind things like it's this is what i want this is like what i want in my life like, well maybe please. if it does well in japan It'll come here, but I think we can all agree that the United States is not ready for any kind of IRL oh, no. escape room experiences. <laughs> it was crazy. I was reading about this, and it's like, it's debuting in December, and I'm like, that's in a couple of weeks. What the fuck? And then I looked at Japan's COVID cases, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's why. They're doing a lot better than Turns we Turns out right a now. lot of the world is yeah. doing pretty good with COVID cases, except for us. We're just on yeah. fire because, you know, people just want to be dumb. Yeah, we can't have nice things. Japan has 119,000 total cases of COVID. The U.S. has 11.1 .1 million cases or has had. It's just bonkers. Um, so yeah. meanwhile, you know, all the Japanese folks out there are going to be living their best life, pretending that they're, you know, fucking, Shin you know, infiltrating Shinra. And then here we are <laughs> infiltrating our houses for like the eighth month in a row. You know, we could make it up on our own if you wanted to. Okay. Yeah, cardboard and everything. It would be so great. No one's Until stopping you from LARPing in your fairy ring outside, Brittany. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if anyone's seen Ant-Man the Wasp. He does that for his daughter in the beginning of the movie, and it's beautiful. So, yeah, oh, why not? Yeah. yeah, you're right. I mean, maybe I need to summon all the gods in the middle of my fairy ring outside. Maybe it'll have some benefit to my life. 
If you guys are confused about Brit's fairy ring, she mentioned it on a show a couple shows back that she has like a literal mushroom ring growing in her front yard. I do. It just sprouted out of nowhere. I'm like, this is a sign. So Steinberg told me that I need to go frolic around in it and take a video for her. So I will. I mean, she did say you had to be naked, but, that's true. you know. I mean, listen, sacrifices must be made. <laughs> If this means Just that we get this slap real on life. that candy corn bikini that you may or may not have, and it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I think for my wife, you listen, friends, you know what? Long distance relationships like Simon and I, you know, we're the waifus. It's hard to maintain, and sometimes you got to keep things fresh. And sometimes that means you got to dance naked in the middle of a mushroom ring and outside your front door. And, you know, if that's what keeps the flame alive, it's okay. I know I'm not the only one in this situation right now. No, many people are doing that. Yeah, people naked in fairy rings. Oh, God. Exactly. Uh. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we do have a couple of quick oh. news items before we get into some of your questions and chat a little bit more with Mario. So you guys may have seen over the weekend that Ghost of Tsushima set a new record as PlayStation's fastest selling original PS4 exclusive with more than 5 million copies sold since its release in July, according to PlayStation Worldwide Studios head Herman Hulst. So that is incredible to hear. Ghost of Tsushima just kicking booty. And I downloaded it on my PS5 and I cannot wait to check it out because I've heard that the visual upgrade is stunning. Oh, my God. The game was already stunning. I know. Okay. I'm so excited, too. This bodes very well for whatever the future of that IP is. I think it was just last month Sucker Punch had posted a job for a narrative, like a writer for their games, and they needed to have a desire to write stories in feudal Japan. And, I mean, of Ooh. course, that could be DLC. It could be a sequel if we're lucky, but I think there's a lot of potential there. So this is very, very good news. Yeah, and I wonder how much of the sales were boosted by the fact that people are trapped in their houses. So, and the fact that people need more options to play, Joe Tsushima was right there, perfect, perfectly at the right time, um, especially right just after um, Last of Us. So, by all means, you know, congratulations to Sucker Punch on that. That's really cool. Yeah. I, I love Sucker Punch and uh, the infamous game. So, this was uh, a nice uh, delight to see them succeed and continue on. So, yeah, and to do I something different. It. Yeah. Did you yeah. check out Legends, the free multiplayer update? So I I opted out only because um, when you play Ghost of Tsushima, it takes over your life in terms of all the things you can do because there's always so many foxes you can get and so many uh, bandanas. That's true. Uh, so I, I felt like I was putting more time in Ghosts than I was in uh, Persona 5. So <laughs> I was like... And what's wrong with that? The, there's nothing wrong with that. No, it's just that I was like, wait a minute, but I still haven't finished Persona 5 Royal. And I'm like, please, I have to try other games. Other games have to exist. And that's nothing wrong. It's a, I, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic game. But didn't you um, already play Persona 5? I per play, I beat Persona 5, but I want to go through Royal because of all the extra new stuff. Mm, gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. But uh, for Ghosts, I decided I'm going to wait. And then now I have the PS5, and that's the perfect time where I'm going to play it. I'm going to oh, play it on the yeah. PS5. It's my new, that's why I thought it was actually going to drop for PS5. So I'm happy that it's here. I do want to make a caveat that it is the backwards compatible version, but because of the way that yes. PlayStation 5 upreses, because I don't believe it is in the PlayStation Plus collection that has no. launched, it's going no, to it probably not. not join that collection, I would guess, for at least another six to 12 months. Because, yeah. you know, Sony wants to keep selling copies of that game. <laughs> um, but congrats. So now that makes Spider-Man PS4 the fastest selling um, exclusive that is licensed. And then I believe Ghost of Tsushima is the fastest selling that is original. So two yeah. fantastic games that you can play on your PS5 if you have one. Or your PS4 if you've got one of those too. Yeah. Um, also, speaking of PlayStation games, Deathloop has a new release date of May 21st, 2021. So we got the news that this game was going to be a little bit delayed. I think May is a great time. I'm excited to play Deathloop. It looks cool. It's from Arcane and Bethesda, and I believe it'll probably be the last of the Bethesda exclusives that they do with PlayStation because obviously that deal was done before the yeah. Bethesda Microsoft deal was announced. Um, so keep your eye out for that. And then sadly, US Gamer had budget cuts that resulted in layoffs. So our heart goes out to all of those people that were affected. Many people, including EIC, Cat Bailey announced that they were made redundant and that they will no longer be working with US Gamer at the end of the year. But um, so if you see any of those folks, 
um, you make sure you let them know that if you liked their work, because that's important when budget cuts happen, it's a bummer, but it's interesting because read pop is the one who actually owns us gamer now. And I have no doubt that PAX is, you know, gutting this year because of the pandemic absolutely had something to do with this. So yeah. yeah. It's just a big bummer. Well, so well. we just want to let you guys know we're thinking about you and we hope that you all find wonderful new homes writing about video games and keep inspiring people's lives that's all um i think i got everything yeah sounds right unless yeah. something yeah. new just happened since we started the show but you know did a lot of make her case. announcement <laughs> <laughs> she uh, would do it now during your show she I, would you know, she would well Twitter, we tried to get her to me. announce it live on the show live on the show and she was like i can't yet and i was like i can't right. confirm she is not working at dual shockers so <laughs> can't confirm oh, that dang. that limits everything who could say well you know the beacon of and, the internet dual and shockers. here i thought i was gonna win that bet um okay so let's move on to dear wgg so this is where we take your guys's questions you can either drop them in the chat or you can write to us at what's good games.com slash dear wgg the benefit of using the website if you're a podcast or YouTube listener is that it allows us to keep your questions. So if we can't get to them on a specific show, we can go back to them at any point. But we will keep an eye on the chat as well. Oh, yes, Stream with Luck. That's a good point. I'm glad you brought up G4. G4 did mention that they're doing a reunion special, yes, which is I happening. Did, did you guys see the teaser this morning? Yeah, with Ron no. Funches. With yeah. Ron Funches? Let me pull mm -hmm. it up. But Mara, you want to tell Britt about it? Tell me all uh, about it. Yeah, it was like a general teaser to be uh, for Ron Funches to be like, I'm going to be your celebrity host, and I'm going to, I want to bring back everyone for G4 for charity. Um, and of course, after the video came out, every Hi. every single one of the main people basically saying, yeah, I definitely want to be a part of this. So um, Adam wow. Sessler, of course, uh, Morgan Webb. Um, they showed uh, Olivia Munn, so that'd be interesting. I'm very excited to see if she would come for this. Um, and then, of course, uh, Kevin Pereira. So... Ooh. That would be cool. Um, I'm, I'm curious if I talk to uh, Rihanna about it. If what's 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 going on with that? I'm I don't curious. know. I don't know if she'll be able to. I know. Talk about <laughs> she will it. definitely not be able to tell me anything. Um, <laughs> but I'm I'm a little hard pressed to believe that they haven't been talking to these people. Like, lol, cool. I think it's cute that you guys were like, please reach out to us and let us know if you'd like to do this as if they didn't have this plan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, G4, and specifically bringing you're up being too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but I love that they're doing it for charity. I think that that's great, raising yeah, money for really good nice. causes. So hopefully we'll learn more about what those causes are and what exactly this reunion is going to be all about but yeah the idea of bringing olivia munn back is an interesting one especially considering that she kind of had a contentious exit from g4 Britt, did you ever yeah. watch g4 i did not like every day or anything but it was attack of the show it was something yes, that i saw back in the day that's actually what inspired me to start writing about video games it was oh, their wow. e3 2000 yeah it was their e3 2009 coverage wow. so yeah it just so happened that i used to commute two hours each way to i am not home. here with that huh? i am not oh, here without you yeah <laughs> yeah no, yeah, uh, definitely. So it'd be cool to see. It's exciting to think about what the future of this whole network is going to be. Well, yeah. Mario, I want to hear about this. What do you mean you wouldn't be here yeah. without G4? Uh, well, without G4 and Tech TV specifically and Screensavers and Alex Albrecht and Kevin Rose and all those people beforehand, uh, I wouldn't necessarily be in games and games media without G4. Um, without them and growing up and watching those shows every day um, on tech on, on, a, on a cable channel and seeing people play video games and talk about video games and electric playground like all that stemmed from early childhood which led then to like revision three and knowing jeff canada uh from totally rad show to later getting into ign and kind of funny and that all started with g4 and tech tv and and i'm very happy to have them come back and possible new uh, opportunities for creators like me. So we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, I'm happy that G4 is back into doing this for charity. I think that's really sweet. Yeah, same. Same yeah. Zs. Um, well, <laughs> I guess we'll keep a I guess we'll keep an eye out and see exactly, you know, what they're going to do and who they're going to get back and I think yeah. it'll be fun. I like that it's like a Thanksgiving special, so clearly it's happening soon. Did they <laughs> give a date? Not, no, uh, it just uh, says G4 state, Holiday yeah. Reunion Special. Hmm, but, uh, I mean, it's got to be 
in the next it's be what, soon. <laughs> 10 days because Thanksgiving is Holy next shit. week. So yeah, we will um, we will keep an eye on that. Um, since you're here and you both love Resident Evil, I thought maybe we could yeah. take Ian's question. Oh, yeah. Because this is oh, a question yeah. that we get from time to time, particularly on the Patreon streams. But Ian wrote into Patreon.com, or not Patreon.com, excuse me, what's goodgames.com slash DRWGG and said, Brittany, I just got allowed to play Resident Evil. I love the game. I'm playing Resident Evil 2 Remake. It's so much fun. What game in the series should I play next? Thanks and love your show. Oh, Mario, I'll pass to you since you are just like the Resident Evil guru now. And then I'll, <laughs> and then I'll pipe in. Uh, so I actually tried to start with the remake, um, of the original Resident Evil game, the GameCube version. Uh -huh. Um, and I got so far and then I got lost. So what I'm going to say is that I'm not necessarily going to recommend that one, even though as much as it's a classic and everyone sh should play it and try their best. If you've already played two, you're kind of maybe invested already with the Leon story. If you were, for some reason, have no interest in learning about Jill Valentine, <laughs> maybe jump straight to four, but... Uh, I will say that if you see, it's hard, right? Because I actually have somewhat contention with Resident Evil 3 this year in terms of what I felt that it did as a remake. But, I, but I'm going to go with my original answer, which is if you are connected to Leon in any way, maybe try 4. I think 4 is pretty accessible. Um, and then skip six that's all that's pretty much what i'll say start at four skip six look at Brian's oh, no. face. she's like what? oh no oh no skip resident evil one hd remake mario have you <laughs> lost your mind what's wrong with you i'm playing kind of not really uh interesting but that is definitely a fair take and i will respect your opinion although i will very i'm also trying to predict like you said you got permission to play resident evil 2 so i'm like uh maybe your mind will happen with three be better four i'm not sure <laughs> You know? Yeah, that, that, that could be a language barrier thing. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. But interesting. Or it could so, be a young person who got yeah. permission from their parents to play a pretty scary, gory game. That's no, true. for sure. And that's why I was like, if they want to go on that same track, I think Resident Evil 3 and 4 follow that track of Resident Evil the Remake. So that's why I'm going in that direction. As much as I love, you know, Resident Evil 1 and, you know, Jill, don't open up that door. Like, I love that game to death. <laughs> Do you? Do you? Okay. No, so here's the thing. Like, yeah. I, if you like, because here's the thing, it's all the classic, aka, in my opinion, the best Resident Evils play in that kind of old tanky style, top down view where you, you know, walk in one direction one way, you, the camera's fixated and there's shiny objects on the ground. It's very different formula, right, than the remake of Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3. And if that to you does not sound appealing, if it's, if you're playing for the gameplay perspective of it, I would say like, yeah, you can probably skip Resident Evil 0, Resident Evil 1, and then I guess from there it would go to Code Veronica, which would break my heart because I love Code Veronica and it doesn't get enough love, but that is just my humble opinion. And then yeah. you could move on to 4 to 5. I mean, 6 is interesting. I think you should experience it as a rite of passage because listen, we've all had to play it. It's not terrible. It's just different, you know. And then obviously 7 Biohazard, I think, is a really great new iteration into the series. But if you if you find yourself like really into the lore of Resident Evil, right? So like, what's the deal with Raccoon City? How did they get to where they are? What is the Spencer estate? What is the origin story of Jill and Chris and Rebecca and Wesker? And like, who are these people, right? I would say definitely check out the first game. While the mechanics are a little, you know, a little older, I personally think it still holds up really well. A friend of the show, Molly Bittner, just recently played through, I think, all of the Resident Evils, and she also really enjoyed the first one as well. After she, I think she played the first one, then she hopped into the second one. But anyway, if you're into the store, the store, the story, go back to one, play one, and then hop into three, and then you can move on. But, you know, it's all about a personal opinion. See, opinions are great. They're like buttholes. Everyone has one. <laughs> and I, I to bring back because you brought up, brought up Code Veronica and I love playing Code Veronica on the Dreamcast um, it is available oh. on PS4 if I'm not mistaken as like a, a downloadable thing so yeah you can play that game that's mm -hmm. game great yeah 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 and worth mentioning that Resident Evil Remake is again like kind of like you were just saying on all the platforms you can get on PS4 yes. Xbox One you can get on Switch if you wanted to it's been, it's like kind of the, the Skyrim of Resident Evil it's pretty much everywhere I mean Resident Evil 4 is more like the Skyrim I guess but you can find it almost <laughs> anywhere yeah play Resident Evil 4 on a PS2 with the chainsaw controller and then you're all dude there. that Wait, chainsaw there was a controller? chainsaw controller yeah there was 
Oh uh, yeah, I have one. Right? Have you? Yeah. Have I was not it shown PS2 this or was it just hold GameCube? On, I'm sorry. Hold yeah, on. go get it, Britt. I feel like you may have shown this off at some point. <laughs> but like, I need a visual. I need a visual representation yeah. of what this exactly is. A chainsaw oh, okay. controller. Let's okay, Britt, let's look. Oh, here we go. No. Oh, you here do you have? Go. Okay, you got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Wait, can you get it, get it a little? Oh, your microphone. Oh, there we go. Okay, oh God, I can yes. see the buttons now. Oh my gosh! Like, how do you how yep. do you even hold that thing though? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the whole like in the back. Oh, you can't see the back. That's yeah, incredible. Like, that's Okay, so for people who can't hear Brittany because she's very far away from her microphone Hello, I'm back. and who there are listening go. on podcast, she is holding a mini chainsaw and the top of the body of the chainsaw is the where the face buttons are. So imagine if the blade was vertical <laughs> on top there, um, flat is where the, um, the sticks and the buttons are. And it looks like there's additional buttons on the side. It's orange. Oh, yeah, like here's and the L2 like button. Fake blood along the blade of the chainsaw. <laughs> yeah. And it looks like it's in some kind of commemorative box with a little label on it because it's, it's obviously a collectible. <laughs> um, but that's it... really cool. So how old is that thing? Oh, wait, don't uh... don't put don't put your mouth on the blade. You'll cut <laughs> I yourself. I didn't. I almost licked it, but that would have been weird. Oh god, when did this game come out? Two thousand. Uh, two thousand two ish. I thought. I yeah, that right. sounds about right. It was way yeah. back in the day. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, definitely. Like, it's a fun collector's item, but like, definitely don't use it to play. <laughs> no, <laughs> if it could work. <laughs> yeah, if, if, even if it did work, it would probably give you arthritis in like three sessions. So like, don't <laughs> don't do it. Just look at it lovingly on a shelf where it belongs. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or in a game store somewhere. Or or that. It's a piece of yeah. history, really, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. It belongs in a museum. Yeah. Or my house. Please stay here. <laughs> um All right. Well, I I want to talk a little bit about this next question because I think it's a great one from Jennifer. Uh, who wrote in and asked, I love Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and I'm worried Valhalla might be too dark in tone and location for me to enjoy. Odyssey was often funny, filled with bright colors, and, unpopular opinion, had awesome side quests. I don't think that's unpopular. Based off my streams, everybody loves the side quests. I also loved Cassandra. How do you think someone who has only played and loved the most recent Assassin's Creed games will feel about Valhalla? So I've been spending a ton of time with Valhalla. I've probably put about 25 plus hours in over the last couple of days just playing a, a bunch of it. And I am with you that I was also worried that it might be too dark. And it definitely has a way more serious vibe than Odyssey did. Now, you can really enjoy that and lean into it as something that feels a little bit more grounded or... You know, you might be looking for something with a little bit more levity. And I get that. I mean, there's been some really serious games this year. And maybe you're not looking for that vibe because your mental health is like looking for rainbows and unicorns. Um, ironically, there is a rainbow ship pack that you can buy for cosmetics in Assassin's Creed Valhalla that feels very out of tone. It would have felt in tone with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but it just doesn't really quite fit with the vibe of Viking fantasy, but I, I still like it nonetheless. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the major key differences between Eivor and Cassandra and Alexios as characters is that there was a lot of humor in the Assassin's Creed Odyssey quests and dialogue and narrative, and there is not a bunch of that here. There is some. There are some funny quips, particularly in the flighting sequence, sequences, which is those rhyming battles that you can do which i recommend that you do because you get charm bonuses and then you can use those charm bonuses in conversations to unlock specific narrative options which is cool but overall it's definitely darker and more serious in tone because it's just a different part of history which was interesting because i was talking about this with with christian and jeff last night talking about how i i forget as somebody who lives in 2020 just how difficult life was back then. And I sometimes judge the way that people make actions in video games based off the way that we live our lives now. Like it would be 100% unacceptable to go to somebody's house and physically assault them and steal their things. 
<laughs> you yeah. know? But like that was that. a way of life for a lot of people back then because in order to survive, you sometimes would just have to physically steal food from people in order to feed yourself if you didn't have the means to like kill animals or grow food on your own. And that to me was hard to grapple with when I first started playing Valhalla because I was really against the raiding and against some of the Viking fantasy elements of the game. And then the more I got to know Eivor and the more I got to learn kind of about the history of the Vikings, which is so weird because I'm actually I'm actually wearing my, my Viking oh, shirt you right are. now because <laughs> oh, we're playing the Bears tonight, uh, Skull. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> so Drake Household's going to be in turmoil, everybody. Um, but... <laughs> Shout out to Drake. Love the guy. <laughs> Chicago. Love it. There we go. Aww. You know, you Chicago people. Um, <laughs> but anyway, not to get too sidetracked, um, is that there was a lot about Viking history that I actually just didn't know about. But it took me a while to really fully understand and appreciate that, like, it was a different era. It was a different time. People had to do really dark things to physically survive. And it kind of almost, I don't want to make it feel like apocalyptic because it wasn't. But I mean, it was a time in human history where there was a lot more violence than there is today because people didn't have other ways to solve their problems. And there's a lot of narrative instances in the game that will make you reckon and wrestle with that morality. And I think that that's really exciting, but it is darker. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make any qualms about that. Like it's, it's true. It is, it's a much darker game than Odyssey. It's interesting you say that because Jason's playing and I've been watching him play it next to me and he's never really one who gives a shit about the story of games. He just cares about the gameplay and how the fun the combat is, et cetera, et cetera. But then yesterday he had to put his controller down. He was like, I feel like an asshole. He's like, I have no idea why I'm raiding these people, why I'm killing all of these people. I feel like I have no reason to do it. So even he noticed that, which I thought was pretty interesting. So to, you hear, to hear you say all of that right now, I'm like, okay, that is a fascinating kind of concept, I feel like. When it comes yeah, to because the raiding is a necessary element of the game in the sense that you can only get specific resources to upgrade your personal settlement at the right. expense of taking down somebody else's settlement. So one of the primary raids that you have to do is to raid monasteries, which is, again, like you're literally infiltrating somebody's house of worship and you're murdering the guards that are protecting their assets in order to steal their gold and their other resources so that you can build homes for people in your own settlement. It's like kind of like galaxy brain messed up in a way <laughs> that we don't have to deal with in the year 2020, but that they yeah. absolutely had to deal with like in 400 BCE or whenever this game is said, I have to double check. Um, and so I'm just like, I, I get it. It's interesting that Jason also had that. I'm sure we're not the only ones. No, no. I find it fascinating when you bring this up because when I think of Assassin's Creed, I've obviously always had the left and right of the Templars and the Assassins, but it sounds like it's more, much more than that in this. Is that fair to say? Um, like, wait, can you the, repeat I'm that? Saying, in terms of like the Assassin's Creed series, it always has like, the, you know your clear enemy is the Templars versus like- I mean, yeah, you you're literally assassinating people all the time, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> where at least you had the ideas like, oh, they're bad people, so this is why I'm doing it. But right. it sounds like in this game, it's definitely far grayer than that, especially with the fact that, yeah, you're, you're, you're it's about your people. So, yes, 100%. And the yeah. game is set, at, excuse me, in 873 AD. So not 400 AD, but not too far off, just sure. a couple hundred years later, but still like very much <laughs> not the enlightened period of human history. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think what makes it different is that you are a Norseman infiltrating England where Saxons are living and you're essentially going into their villages and taking things from them so that you can set up your camp because you've run out of resources in your home of Norway. And in order to, for your clan to survive, you have to move to like literally more greener pastures. <laughs> um, <laughs> and to do that, you know, it means you have to take down on these other people. Now I haven't found a way to do it non-lethally because when you raid, you bring in your ship of, you know, homeboys and girls, and they go about killing people. Like, you can't stop them. So even if you as yeah. Eivor choose to try to not kill people, like everybody else in your clan is going to, and there will be situations where you have to murder people. You can't play this entire game non-lethally. And that's just going to be something that you as the player have to decide if you're okay with the fantasy of video game violence. Again, this is a goes back to a, an age-old conversation about video games, or if it's something that, 
you don't want to experience. You just rather not. And it's totally okay if you're like, you know what? That doesn't sound like an experience that I want right now. I want maybe a Peggle 2 experience instead. <laughs> There's so much yeah. violence in Peggle 2, though. So oh, violence. man. Those but it's got a great unicorn. Speaking of oh, unicorns. <laughs> so good. Go. I think my favorite is the crab guy who flips the little the ball. <laughs> yes. Anywho. Oh, yeah, so it's an interesting, it's still an interesting conversation. And like Andrea said, it's totally okay depending on how you're feeling. Because I remember when Doom came out, Doom Eternal. I like tried playing it and I just couldn't. And I had been so excited for that game. It was because it was too intense. It was like too violent, which is like a weird thing for me to say because I love like Resident Evil and like all this other shit. But yeah, it was just too intense of a game for that moment. And I think now I'm probably at a place where I feel like, okay, going back and playing it. But if not, that's okay. Plus that game's just hard. Yeah. yeah. Plus Animal Crossing at that time was yeah, like Animal taking Crossing, up my man. life. Oh you know? yeah. Oh, yes. Good old yeah, Animal yeah. Crossing. Except I'm having an impossible time getting my mushroom DIYs, and I'm very <laughs> upset about it. <laughs> oh, no, the mushroom saga continues. I know. Uh, I have plenty of mushrooms, just no recipes. <laughs> so sad. Um, anyway, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, we are getting to the end of our show. Mario, I want to thank you for, for joining us. Um, if people want to follow your work and check out what you guys do at Dual Shockers, where can they do that? Uh, yes, you can follow my work at youtube.com slash dual shockers, where you will see both editorials, uh, previews, reviews. I will be doing a Miles Morales video very, very shortly. There's actually um, a panel I'm trying to build uh, where there will be voices that you will see in the community um, talking about Miles Morales. I'm saying that now, hoping that everyone commits properly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but ultimately, yes, I, I will love to have that out uh, very, very shortly. And uh, of course, you can also find me at that Mario Ver on Twitter, where you or you can harass me like uh, Brittany did when I uh, said oh, yeah. that I wanted to be on shows. So you know, yeah, you, you looked at all these shows you wanted to be on, and what's good was nowhere to be found. I'm like, this kid needs some shit flipped his way, <laughs> and that's what I did. Yeah. And now Everything. here you are with I know, shit on right? your face. <laughs> oh, oh God, that is a clip. <laughs> that is a clip. No, that's gonna no, go my no. Reel. Come on, come on now. Um, but no, it was, <laughs> it was great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for for joining us today. Uh, we'll be back later in the week, everybody. We hope that you have a happy Monday and enjoy the rest of your week. Bye, everybody. <laughs>